In this lecture segment, we introduce contemporary art with a focus on works from the 1980s and 1990s. This is the first of two lectures dealing with contemporary art, or art of today, generally art made by living artists, the art of the present day world. The works of art we are studying are examples of contemporary art made by living artists, but are also examples of postmodern art. Postmodern art, like in our discussion of postmodern architecture, refers to art made after modernism. Postmodern art is diverse and rich and dynamic, but there are themes that connect these works. We see artists using their production as a tool for activism, and especially trying to make viewpoints heard that otherwise have not gotten attention in art previously, and that struggle getting attention in the contemporary world. We will look at not just American artists, but the panoply of international artists creating the world's first global art. We'll see art is concerned with issues of gender, sexuality, racism, oppression, and class stratification, directing attention to communities that are disadvantaged and ignored. We see artists rewriting history, using history and art history to magnify their critiques and observations of the present day. We see artists devising new ways of interacting with the viewer, like works of art viewers touch or take. We see the revival of traditional media and techniques that were no longer used, but we also see new types of media, especially digital media and multimedia experiences. We will not see a narrative of progress like we saw with the trajectory of modernism, as we were pushing towards the so-called magical moment of full, full abstraction in modern art, or the moment of losing the object in conceptual art. In postmodern and contemporary art, we are on a great artistic odyssey, but we don't have a destination or goal in mind. It's a diverse period of production that we are in the midst of now. Postmodern artists use their art to express a variety of viewpoints, drawing on their art historical knowledge to adapt a range of approaches to art creation and visual vocabularies. Let's explore this work to see how many of the trends we tracked in the 20th century we can find. Native American artist John Quick to see Smith is a member of the Flathead Nation and wanted to be an artist since she was young. She uses her work to draw attention to concerns in the diverse Native American community and to help other Native American artists forge successful careers. This example pulls from much of the history of art in the 20th century and earlier. It's a triptych, a three-paneled piece, like Campan's Maroda altarpiece, so she references the history of European art. The work includes three panels which have been painted, but also collaged, with snippets from the popular press that prompt the viewer to reconsider stereotypes of Native Americans and their understanding of the history of North America. So this has connections to the Cubist approach we saw in Picasso's Still Life with Chair Caning and his collages. The application of paint resembles gestural abstraction, one of the divisions of abstract expressionism, and then above is a line, like the type of line someone would use to string up fish that had been caught, or a clothesline, but it's been strung with everyday objects that propagate Native American stereotypes or are forms of cultural appropriation. Washington Redskins hats, Kansas City Chiefs paraphernalia, feather headdresses that are tourist versions of sacred ritual clothing referencing how Native American cultures have been commodified and appropriated. The use of everyday objects references pop art, and the use of ready-made objects connects to Dada and conceptual art. Smith creates a work that does what many contemporary and postmodern artists do. It expresses a critique of the way mainstream Eurocentric culture thinks about the world. The title of the work relates to the stories about European colonists thinking that they were buying land from Native Americans, offering trinkets in exchange for territory, and the artist prompts the viewer to consider if they would be willing to make such a trade to exchange knickknacks for land. The work's expression of an underrepresented viewpoint, the references to art history, the use of appropriation, everyday materials, and connection to current issues all root it within postmodern art and help the viewer to question the way things are. Talking about two memorials in which artists adopt different visual vocabularies and materials to accomplish similar goals helps us see how artists use their art historical lessons and make diverse contributions to art history to help humans remember and reflect on loss. The first is by American artist Maya Lin, who was a 21-year-old architecture student when she submitted a design proposal to a competition for a commission to design a Vietnam War Memorial on the Mall in Washington, D.C. It was a prestigious and desirable commission, with lots of public attention and very prominently placed. The White House is here. Here's the Washington Monument and the Capitol Building. 
Design proposals were submitted anonymously, and her proposal, which you see here, number 1026, was selected, but as Lin has said publicly, had the jury or selection committee known she was the daughter of Chinese immigrants, odds are her design would not have been considered. Her proposal and its final design are simple, a V-shaped black wall that goes down into the earth and then back up. In this overhead view, we see that it's like a scar on the earth, which is how many of the Vietnam generation feel about the literal and metaphorical wounds created by this war. Lin uses the clear, simple visual language of minimalism in her work, which is somewhere between architecture and sculpture, in the creation of the site-specific work created for a particular location, like the spiral jetty. She uses smooth lines, clear geometric forms, no illusionism, and a surface that reflects the visitor, like in Judd's stacks, when the visitor can see themselves reflected in the work. Also like minimalism, the work is scaled to the experience of the viewer, and the work is in the viewer's space on the same level as the visitor, creating a profound poignancy for a visitor, coming to the memorial to find a name, which are not listed in alphabetical order, but listed in order of date of death without including ranks. The viewer goes down into the earth in a controlled path that moves chronologically through the years of the war and then back up to the surface. Lynn created a memorial that provides the viewer an introspective reflective experience, magnifying the ability of minimalistic visual language to connect with the viewer and elicit an emotional response. Cuban-American artist Felix Gonzalez Torres studied photography and received an MFA in New York. In his candy spills from the early 1990s, he created a living perpetual memorial to his partner, Ross, who died of AIDS in 1990. The work consists of just candy, commercially produced, that the museum replenishes to equal the weight of Ross, so it's cyclically depleted and refilled. Viewers come and partake of the candy. It's almost sacramental, like communion. We as visitors take and eat with the intention of remembering. Gonzalez Torres merges art as idea that we saw in conceptual art with the purity of minimalism. What we see is what we get, and the work of art is right in our space and on our scale as viewers to create a reflective, poignant, perpetual memorial to Ross. The work also continues to shift the definition of art. Usually when we go to a museum, we look at art. We try to stay 18 inches away from the works. We don't touch anything, and we certainly don't put anything in our pockets to take away from the museum. But he changes our relationship with the art object, encouraging us to take, and only in taking do we have a complete experience of the work. And the work gradually disappears, echoing the lack of attention and support given to those suffering from AIDS. It's a really gentle work that helps the viewer to think about the issues the artist brings up during the AIDS epidemic in the 1990s, and how he involves the viewer in making meaning out of this work that expresses the universality of loss. Gonzalez Torres provides a different approach to making a memorial than Lynn, but both use principles of minimalism to help viewers and visitors quietly ponder, reflect, and consider loss and absence. Contemporary artists often use their own bodies in their work, as we saw in post-minimalism with Cindy Sherman and Anna Mendieta, and they use their bodies for a variety of reasons, as befits the diversity of postmodern art. Chuck Close created this painted, massive self-portrait in the late 1960s as part of superrealism, using paint to make an image that looked like a photograph, a traditional medium used in an unexpected way, and merging photography with painting, blending the media through his application of paint. Much of his production is huge images of other artists, but he continued to use his image as well. He described the period of time in which he created his process, saying that, We were all figuring out ways to build an image rather than paint it, and that is what we see happening here. This example from 1997 is painted, but mimics images made of pixels, continuing some of the interests in mass media and celebrity that we saw in pop art. Close uses a traditional medium, but applies it not according to the application of paint that we saw in academic art. He's not modeling using chiaroscuro. He's not using an impressionistic bro broken brushstroke. He is actively using paint to mimic digital imagery, relying, like Seurat did, on the human eye to blend colors. The same knowledge of vision that was the basis for television, color printing, and digital imagery. 
as you can see in this image of his process, he paints squares of solid color and then adds concentric shapes of color on top of his colored grid to create these pixel-like forms. He suffered a spinal, spinal blood clot in 1988 and is mostly paralyzed today. His use of his face as the subject of his work allows him to embody the artistic trends of postmodern art. He takes a traditional subject, the artist's self-portrait, like what we saw with Rembrandt and Leicester, artists showing what they can do, and he gives it a postmodern spin by breaking down the barriers between media and drawing on new digital media in an unexpected way. As we move into the 2000s, we see artists continuing the themes of postmodern contemporary art that we've talked about in this lecture.